Hey guys, Ryan Gill here with Hunt Primitive where we entertain, educate, and inspire. And on this channel we do a lot of primitive build and or hunting videos just like this one. So if you're new here, do please consider subscribing. But in this video, you're going to be joining me in my backyard as this is going to be a rather intensive build on creating a bow with nothing but Stone Age tools. And this is based off of a previous video that we shot on primitive woodworking tools and the dissection and building of those tools and I'll drop a link down in the description uh, of that video so you can find it and watch it but we're going to be going through this over a, a fair period of time and we're gonna let you know how long things are taking uh, different drying times that we're letting the bow set up to lose moisture uh, lots of little different details along the way. Now you are probably going to hear a lot of background noise as this is a very involved video and I can't stop and cut every single time kids are outside playing, dogs are barking, cars are driving by, airplanes go over. So this is an educational video. Hopefully you find some good entertainment out of it as well. So this is merely a documentation of the process of me working through this build. So I don't normally build all my bows with Stone Age tools, obviously. Now I have done Stone Age builds before, but they've been rather crude. We're going to work through a really nice build, some of which are going to be experimental techniques, some I know exactly what I'm doing. So instead of simply teaching you how the best way to do it is, we're going to go through and just simply document my process and naturally I'm going to choose the methods that work best for me especially that line up with that previous video of primitive woodworking tools that's why I did that video first so anyway let's follow along let's get started on this bow so we started with this piece of hickory that I went and cut down green and it is quite nice and straight as you can see not super super straight but it's pretty darn straight and it has now been about a week since I cut it. So now what's important to me is we don't want to let it go too long and we don't want to work it too fast. And the reason is, especially this time of year, it's just the beginning of spring. And so there's a lot of moisture in the trees and the bark will slip off very, very easily, which is nice. But the problem is because if we take the bark off immediately, then the back of or uh, any of the wood for that matter, is going to crack because as it loses moisture very, very fast, the wood has no choice but to split and crack as the outside gets drier than the inside. So that's why I've learned that you, if you're gonna make a bow like this, typically what we say is we take a stave, we cut down the tree, we split it out, we keep it indoors, we seal the back or we leave the bark on it, and we let it sit for 12 to 18 months. Now, that is a very good uh, method to practice. That's how we normally build our bows. But in this scenario, we're going to make one that's a little bit faster. And I would say primitive man most likely would have two or three bow staves going at one time, especially because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. If one fails, you need to have kind of a backup plan anyway. So the best case scenario would be to go cut two or three good staves or one tree and split them into staves. But if you get those extra staves, you'd set one up uh, in your structure which you're living in and let it dry over a period of time. And then you have a nice dry piece of wood. And then while all that's happening, and if you need a bow, you currently don't have one or need a replacement, you're going to take a green piece of wood and we're going to make this into a bow and it's probably not going to be the best bow but it'll be serviceable and we'll use it until that other piece that's been drying, we can turn that into a good bow. So, hope you followed along with all that. Alright, and working through this project without a tape measure, you may wonder how long to cut your bow safe. So, everybody's going to be a little bit different depending on your style of shooting, your style of archery, how far you draw the bow. Realistically, the length of the bow is determined by how far you are planning to draw the bow back because wood does have a limit. Now, that's a lot of basics of bow building stuff and if you want to know all the basics, I'm not covering every little detail of the basics. It's more of the tool application and the process of building. But if you do want to know everything that there is to know about primitive bow building, even with more modern tools, metal tools, I'll drop a link down in the description to my book, Primitive Bow Building. 
and that's going to teach you everything you need to know about how to size your bow and judge your draw length. So anyway, for I have a very short draw typically, and what I'm going to be shooting for is a bow stave that's about as long as my chin, but because we're going to have a little bit of loss on either end, because as we cut this off, there's going to be a little bit of rounding, I'm going to make it just, just a tiny bit longer, but not very much. And now remember, we can always cut some off later, but we can't add more on. So if when in doubt, make it, make it even as tall as you are. So when you're talking about the old English war bows are as tall as a man, of course we're not drawing these bows back nearly as far as they were, and uh, we can get away with some shorter lengths. Quite honestly, I could cut a bow that's all the way down to here, and it would still, this amount of bow is plenty for my draw length. But I do want a little extra length for now, and then if I need to cut it down later to gain a little bit of weight or to change the build slightly, I can do that. So I give myself a little bit of wiggle room, and for me, I'm going right under my chin, and then just a tiny bit more to account for loss. So that's where I'm gonna cut this piece of wood off, and I'll be left with the stave that we can start turning into a bow. And the idea, of course, is not to just sit and completely abuse your tools or abuse the piece of wood. We're not in a rush. So we're going back and forth and see how we're just taking small bits out. If we sit here and just beat on this thing, we're gonna get exhausted, we're gonna tear the tool up, it's easy to make a mistake, and we don't wanna do that. So now, my method for cutting this actually down to size is gonna be a slight angle, a, lot, a little bit of straight down, and a little bit of angle this way, because what we're trying to do is cut this off to have a relatively straight edge. So, let's see what I was saying about a little bit of loss. As you make some mistakes, it'll, it'll start automatically eating itself right back. But as we get some of this chopped out, then I'm going to come in at a much steeper angle. This will make more sense once I get deep into the wood because we won't be able to just reach in with the tool. So we have to create a longer channel for the tool to come in and work on. So this is obviously the side we're not using. That'll be saved for other tools or go in the firewood pile. Depends. But you then see how we can just remove this? And it's not taxing, it's not hard work. And then remove more this way. Now this is a spot that having a good adds could come in handy if you don't have a hand axe it's got a relatively round back this one's very comfortable and I don't I'm not a big fan of the compound tools because it's more joints to fail and more things to go wrong and I'm not saying I won't use the ads at all because I very well may but see this tool is so efficient it's very sharp the edge is much harder than a bone or antler adds and I could make a stone adds, but they are prone to break. If you've watched that from the other video, there's a lot of problems. So sometimes the simplest answer is the best answer. There's no sense in overcomplicating this build. This stuff works great, and it doesn't need hardly any maintenance. So we didn't have to create a, a big elaborate build to create this. We, we just literally knocked flakes off of it. And if you don't have a comfortable round backed piece to hang on to, if you just have it blunt, wrap this piece in leather and hold it so it doesn't eat your hand up. Now, of course, if you don't have any sort of flint or chert in your area, that's when you're going to have to use bone or antler tools or even peck and grind celts. But they're not so good at cutting like this. They're, they're more for crushing fibers and separating them over a period of time. So, right now this is the most efficient tool that I have. And it's working wonderfully as you can see. Oh, I showed you the wrong spot. I showed you the... There we go. I was like, well, it doesn't look like I took anything off. So the further in that you go, I'm going to turn this sideways so you can kind of see it there. The further in that you go, you can start cutting more straight down and almost shaving 
this side because we want it to be we don't want it to be really crowned over heavy we want it to be relatively flat when we work with it almost like it was cut off with a saw so I think that should make a little more sense to you how we are using this long channel so we're not fighting trying to get into this well, we're able to sculpt this really easily it's not difficult to use this tool it doesn't take a lot of energy but there we can see now we can see the nice cut in that we're getting so now I can start working around the sides a little bit but you're gonna find it as different ways that you work this you might have to position rocks under it see this has got a little bit of a bounce to it now because it's not on the ground so something like taking that another stick or a rock give it a little bit of stability you'll be back to a good platform again and this is where you gotta be careful you don't want to take your first initial ones be too aggressive and end up running back in or slipping and hitting your hand so all in all you can see the the speed that we're kind of working through this this is a cutting cutting a branch off that's about as big around as a oh well maybe a little bit smaller than the large end of a wood baseball bat it's going to be a, it's like a 10 or 15 minute job it's not long it doesn't take hours to do this but we're going slow anyway because we want to do a nice job we're not just hacking this thing out this is primitive precision if you will now you see how we kind of make a little bit of a peak right there now that's an easy place we can come in and take out a nice piece of wood there pretty quick all right so there you can see we're halfway through and we're actually really flat and nice on this side nothing split out we, we took a lot of care to get it to this point and now we can flip it over or just continue to work all the way around whichever you want to do sometimes it is difficult to flip completely over to make sure that you don't want to be at a different uh, starting place so if you do just score it just ever so lightly so when you do flip it over you know exactly where you're working and we'll do the same exact thing on this side until it separates and then we'll be done cutting it to length all right so we've beaver chewed this all the way around very very nicely figured I'd catch you up just as we finish it off and see I just run in straight circles on this thing and we could just break it off but I don't want to run the risk of splitting so for the extra two minutes probably not even two minutes it's gonna take to chisel it we got a nice edge right that's a beautiful edge for chopping right there this fine little extra work just about through it. Here it is. Beautiful. That's what that end looks like. So, what I am going to do is just clean that up ever so slightly. And that. And that is it. Okay, so now we're going to strip the bark. And I'm going to do it awkwardly just to kind of show you it first. And then. I'll switch it around but what I got here is just an antler chisel you've probably seen me work with this before and what I'm doing is I'm it's not it's sharp but it's not like cut you sharp but it's a nice wedge a ground down and what I'm doing is wedging this in between the bark and the wood now we don't want to hurt the wood I don't care if we mess the bark up but we do not want to hurt the wood so I'm wedging this in between and then just prying it up until it'll start to peel. Now, this time of year, the bark does peel easier, and that's again one of the reasons that we waited a week, because yes, we do want it to peel relatively easy, but it's still quite, quite wet in here, but it's not as wet as it would be if we wouldn't have waited that week. So now you can just use this by hand, and then also, grab a hold of it and just pull these chunks off so now what I normally do 
is split a piece. Boy, it's just sharp enough to almost get you. Good thing it's not super sharp. Is what I normally do is split a piece of wood and then let it dry a little bit and then debark it. But because this one is not terribly big around, what I'm worried about is, and you can get away with this a little bit on hickory, having it more, it's like a large sapling. The high crown on hickory you can get away with. A lot of other woods you, you're not going to be able to, but hickory you definitely will. Something like cherry will end up fretting on the belly. So that's why hickory is such a great option for this. But normally I would split this and then take the bark off. So I'm going to end up, but since it's pulling so easily, I'll have this whole stave debarked in about three minutes. But uh, the reason I don't want to split it, like I said, is because it's relatively narrow. So chances are by the time I get down to the center of the bow, especially it might split slightly off to one side, I might not have enough mass in the handle to make the weight of the bow that I want to because if you don't have enough mass in the handle, it'll bend in the handle. And if it bends too much, you have to take material off the rest of the limbs of the bow to even the tiller out, which we'll learn a little bit more later. So, instead what I'm going to do is leave the handle a little bit fuller, and I'll flip it around so it's easier for me to work, now that you know what I'm doing. So what I'll do is I'll leave the handle a little bit fuller, and then I'll take splits off of uh, the limbs, but we'll show you that when we get to it. For right now, you can just see we're just getting up under it. And just separating, I'm not cutting into the wood at all. All right, so now what we're looking for is we want to look down the piece of wood, keep rotating it, and find the spot that's got the flattest amount of crown and it looks like it'll make the best back of the bow, the piece of the bow that's going to face away from you. And so make sure you look it over really good. If it's got a bow one way, take that into account. But you want the flattest piece. In fact, when I turn it this way, the bow actually has the highest crown, but it looks like it would make the straightest bow. But because the crown is so high, I want to use a, at least a flatter side for my crown. So I don't mind just a tiny bit of wiggle. I just don't want a lot, and so this is going to be my go-to side. So now that I have decided that, I have a piece of um, just charcoal on the end of this stick, and I'm just going to take a, a light marking. I don't usually mark a whole lot on bows, except for on these uh, round saplings, because it's real easy to twist it and lose your spot. So then what I want to do is I'm going to put a mark facing different ways to show where I want, it's just charcoal so it'll come off, where I actually want the back of the bow to be. That way there's no confusion later. I can flip it around, make sure that it looks good from all angles. And that's where we can draw. where we basically want to split the bow stave. It's right about there. But we're actually not going to completely split it. We're going to split some, but not very much. So now, I'm going to back up, crouch down here to show you. I want to reach out and I want to make this, put this in even spots in my fingers, same finger joints, and let this naturally hang. Not forced one side, but just naturally hang and where it crosses right in the center of your chest, that's the center of the bow stave. So the center of the bow stave is right here where my thumb is. This is where I want the back of the bow to be, so I'm going to go ahead and put a big line right across there. I have a habit of drawing a C on it, but I'll put a couple really dark lines just in case some of this charcoal comes off. But it should be on there pretty good, at least for as long as we need it to be. So that's the center of our bow, and remember we did that by holding this out, and then you can always double check it. And that should fall right in the middle of your chest, 
when you hold it naturally, just like that. <clears throat> so that's how you find center without a tape measure. And you don't need a string, you can just hold it up to your body. So this is gonna be the back of our bow that faces away. This will be the belly that in which we will remove material, but we do not wanna remove any material now from this side of the bow, only the belly side. Now I also want you to keep in mind that if you were gonna work this out and set it up to dry for a large amount of time, what we could do is if we have beeswax or even some animal grease, especially if it's mixed with beeswax, is we could coat the back of this once we work the belly side down a little bit, and that'll keep the back from getting any sort of cracks or check marks on it. But being that this is supposed to be a little bit faster of a build, this isn't the one that we're putting up. I've got plenty of old states for that. We need this one to work out pretty quick. I'm gonna leave the back exposed. That's why we waited a week. So it lost a lot of moisture. And once we remove a lot of mass off the belly of this bow, it'll start drying faster. And we'll probably end up with some little drying check, little cracks in the back. But as long as they're the little drying check cracks, it will not hurt the stability, longevity, or performance of the bow. It may take a little bit away from the way that it looks, but honestly, you'll probably never ever notice them. And you can really get away with that on hickory. It's not a big deal. Most woods, little tiny drying checks aren't a big deal. It's when you have the big cracks. But that's why we can't just leave it in this full form. We have to reduce it to that sap tube. And on this side, you can actually see that the sap tube is much bigger and more oblong. I actually had to consider that in my build, but I've already looked it over enough. I think we're gonna be okay. I tested it, I stuck a stick. It doesn't go in there very far to where it narrows out. But what's gonna happen is there's that sap tube that runs right up through the middle of the tree. And if you don't come right to that sap tube or really close to it, it's gonna crack on the belly side to that sap tube. So if you leave it in its whole form just like this and don't seal it or even if you seal the whole dang thing whenever it finally starts to dry out it's going to crack somewhere and you have no idea where it's going to crack and sometimes it'll crack over here a ways and then over here a ways it'll go everywhere because it's got to, it wants to crack right to that center sap tube so to prevent that from happening we're going to rough the bow out now and I'm gonna leave a little bit of mass in the handle. I'll chisel that down later, but I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna work in from the handle in a second, and then create where we can split the limbs off, most likely, and either get expose the sap tube, go past the sap tube, or get really, really close to it. And that way, when it cracks, the place that it's gonna crack, if it does at all, will be on the belly side, just go into the sap tube, and hopefully we won't have any cracks on the back of the bow. And that's just the nature of working with wood in general, especially when you're trying to do it fast, you may end up with cracks. All right, so now then that we have our center line marked on the bow, and then this is the back of the bow, and I lost my little charcoal pencil, which is a little bit of a shame, but I can get another one later if I need it, not a big deal. Don't need it right now. What I'm gonna do is look at where the back is gonna be on this. And I'm going to flip it completely upside down, checking our side marks, make sure we are upside down. This is the center on the bow. I'm going to put my hand right here, and I'll put a line. If we had charcoal pencil, we'd use that, but I lost it. But I'll just cut a couple scoring lines into this, and that's going to let us know where we're going to put the handle. And then double check your work. It's a little bit a little bit further out on one side than the other, not a big deal. And we're not leaving a great big handle like a, like a modern cell phone. We're gonna work it down. I just need to make sure that we have enough mass in this as we move forward that we're not gonna end up with too light of a bow. So again, I'm gonna make sure over and over and over that I'm removing material from the correct side. And we're gonna kinda do what we did a minute ago by, in fact, I'm gonna spin it around now that I've started this side. And we're gonna kind of chop in and then chop back to that spot. And what we're trying to do is create a relief. We're not trying to cut it in half. 
But once I get this, like I said, doing this kind of the same exact thing as we did when we cut it to size, once I get it cut to that point, then I'll meet you back here and I'll show you why I'm doing this. And then it's going to make a heck of a lot more sense. So another quick note here is I've swapped the bow back around, so I was working that side, is I don't necessarily want to cut straight down like I did when we were cutting it back. I want to bevel it back and forth. That's not a big deal. I just wanted to make a mention that it's okay to remove material from both sides of this notch as opposed to straight down on one side because we're going to have to remove this anyway. But as we get a little bit closer, just figured I wanted to make mention of that. So when you come back and you see that it's chiseled on both sides, it doesn't confuse you. But all we're getting down is it, we're getting down to a level in which we can control the depth in which we want to start splitting the limb out. And we can split a limb off this way and cut another notch here, split this notch, but we're going to be able to leave the handle section whole and then reduce that only as far as we want it as opposed to trying to split this entire thing in one shot, which normally I would do, but we do run the great risk of it splitting through the handle and becoming way too thin, and the next thing you know, we're with an underweight bow that's not good for anything, except for playing around and shooting little tiny game. But we want something we can go out and shoot, you know, big game with this bow. All right, we'll show you how it's gonna to come together now, so you can see this is the handle of the bow, and this is that notch we cut, and that's on the belly side. And like I said, we got a lot of distraction, a lot of noise in the background. This is something I can't really stop once I'm working on it because if we let it go too long, it's going to crack. So this is, a, this is a backyard build. And keeping in mind that primitive man and primitive civilization, they lived around people talking and kids playing and dogs barking. Just the same as we do today, just minus the sound of the vehicles and lawnmowers and such. So anyway, we cut this notch in. And remember our handle's on this side, so I'm going to lay it down this way so you can kind of see. And it's our antler chisel. And we need to make sure that we're on the inside of this, because if we're on this side, it doesn't. then we just did this whole notch for nothing. So you dig it down just a tiny bit more than you think you need it. And we may still have to correct it in a minute, but you got to take a good sized rock. Just batoning it with a stick, you'll probably never get it to really go in. You're going to have to really hammer to get this started. Okay, that's a little bit better. So now I'll just move my line up because it does kind of want to follow the sap tube, but we need to also be really careful that if you cut too far into here, there's only, at some point, you're gonna lose the strength of the bow, but we still should have a long way to go. But I think we're good, but if you, if you can just, just reach that sap tube, it'll split so much easier. Sometimes the angle of your chisel makes a difference. Keeping in mind too that green hickory is only cut a week ago is so much more difficult to split than when it's seasoned. But see, we got it there. And I got a couple other tools. Got just a deer antler nap and tie and a piece of uh, bison horn I use for a uh, punch. Use the bison horn. There we go. Release the chisel. Now we can kind of baton this. Maybe, maybe not. There we go. All right, so we pop this piece off. So now the now it did not obviously split exactly where we wanted. There's that sap tube I was telling you about. It didn't split exactly where we wanted. It's still following it. We might be able to split some more. That's a possibility, but the idea is you don't have to split it. You're not going to split it directly down into a bow. You still have work to do from here. But look at all the wood we just removed that easily by splitting a piece off of this. Now, what's funny is I can actually save this and make an atlet I'll throw out of it, and I absolutely will, and I'll save the other side as well if it makes it. But it just saved us from having to chisel off every little bit of that wood. And we got a little byproduct that we can use. So now, all right, so just literally five minutes later, it's all along our takes. Doesn't take long at all. We cut that piece to split it. Now, of course, sunlight doesn't want to cooperate with us. Hopefully, you can see what I'm doing. 
but it's the same process. I'm gonna find this good spot for this chisel to slide in. Gotta watch your fingers, that's for sure. Much bigger piece. I got us a lot closer to the limb shape that we want, the limb size that we want. Much, much closer. There we go. Pop that right off. Look okay, through there. And it's split right down. Oop, I gotta be careful on this side. I'm gonna end up ripping it and ruining the bow. But you can see it split right down to the sap tube, if you can see that from there. But what we're doing, you can see the grain is caught here and it's really run as thin. So I am hoping that we did not split into this limb too far. But I'll roll this one back and take it off. Well, maybe I can't. But now I need to cut this in. To intercept this split. Oh yeah, it's in there deep too. So that's kind of a bummer. Hopefully, not too deep, but we probably won't know until we actually get it off there. So don't force it, just cut down to it till it releases. Like that, just about. All right. The only reason I'm ripping this piece off, get rid of it, because I can use that for another atlatl thrower. So, you can see what happened here. Get in here close. This side actually split off quite nice. Got a nice angle, because we're gonna trim this handle down anyway. This side, it dug in really far. So you can see how that was just that little splinter that came off, and that's on the outside of the grip, so I don't care. I think we have I think we have plenty of material here to work with, but we're gonna get down to it where we do probably never wanna remove anything else right here. But I'll switch around this side, it's a little bit bigger so I can work it. Cause I'm gonna go ahead and cram this in and take a good chunk of this grip right off. I may go ahead and try to get another split right here, but I don't know if we're actually going to be able to get it to travel as, as far and as nice as we did this side, especially with the risk that we have that we could again become too thin. But I do have a little bit extra material to work with, so I'm going to try a little one. Now, well, we're not going to get a full a full width split, but I can get up under here and just walk this down. Just like that. When it starts getting tight, tap it again. And that's the one good thing about hickory is once you get it going, even when it's green, you can typically split it. So probably do the same thing here. I got a little piece. I might be able to just grab it. I can. So we're going to be able to remove material off this bow by really pulling quite a bit. go. Now you wouldn't be able to do that so easy if it was dry. There we go. But that's why it's good to rough it out when it's still relatively green. Now it doesn't hurt to have a nice backstop back here too that I don't have right now but if in the future I probably will. I'll probably move over close to a tree. But right now it's working just fine. And see how much material we're splitting just by getting it started and peeling with the grain. 
Okay. Another nice bit of material. So here's an important piece that I do want to touch on because somebody may inevitably ask, I'll move the camera, I say, why don't you use that stone axe that worked so good? Why don't you chop it? And I'm going to show you why. Because remember, the stone axe doesn't have a smooth edge. So what we're doing Does it remove material? Yes. But it's all this fibery bunch of junk up here. And yes, you can remove material with that. And that's what I started using it for, was just to kind of get me a new layer. But really all it's doing is marring the wood. And it's not creating enough of a piece that we can grab onto. All we're getting is this little tiny stuff. But if we use this antler chisel and start a new one, you know, with the batoning it in, that's when we can get a big strip to remove. All right, so now this is how it's gonna work with a backstop. So I stuck it up against my stone fire pit. And now we'll see I get a little bit more bite. So a backstop's definitely gonna help you. A little bit of spring to the wood anyway. Then you can get a piece, pull it off, throw it in the fire pit. Larger bits of wood. And we could chisel that all the way down, but why on earth would we? Once we get a, a fiber started, we can just grab and peel. That's a lot more efficient way of removing wood. All right, well now's a good time to bring this up. Somebody might say, well now's a good time to use that ads that you made in the woodworking video. Uh, so it's an antler tipped because we broke the bone pretty easily. The stone breaks and comes out way too easily. So here we are using antler. And somebody would say, well that's a great job for this. So let's go ahead and give it a try and see what happens. I already know, because I tested it. It does the same thing. All right, so then why not use this? Because it does work. You can effectively smash off enough of this, but it's not terribly effective, as you can see. And it's putting wear and tear on the joint that we had to put together and the tool that took us hours and hours and hours to make not hours and hours, but several hours, to put this together. In the grand scheme of things is, the other tool not only works, does the same job, but it does work better, and it's not as tiring, because you're not just sitting here pecking the ever-loving life out of this piece of wood. So that's why, despite even having this compound tool, I have pretty much no interest in using it. Now we could upscale it and we could make a bigger one. We absolutely could, but why am I going to allocate the time to making a bigger one of these when I have an antler chisel and a rock that has no no compounding parts to fail and it works so so well. So that's the important part. So then, hey Ryan, what are you going to use this for? Well, it's kind of makes a nice garden and hoe. <laughs> so with your stave all roughed out just like this. Now, you're not in quite as much of a rush as you were as soon as you popped the bark. So just remember, as soon as you pop the bark on this, you're kind of on the time clock because if you just leave it for a couple days in that whole form, then you're gonna be riddled with cracks. So you need to get it roughed down to a point like this. Obviously, we're still gonna thin the handle out because I'll probably get a crack in here. I don't really care about it cracking in the handle doesn't bother me. And the limbs are obviously still extremely wide and they're still, still thick but I don't want to bend this at all now because this wood is still green. So I'm not going to try to floor tiller this because I'm just going to damage the wood. So now I can continue working on it, continuing to reduce it down, but we're not in so much of a rush. So if you have other things to do, if you need to set it up for a few days, that's perfectly fine. And I prefer to set it in a place that it's not going to be in the direct sunlight yet because it is still freshly losing moisture because we just popped the bark off. So 
put it in kind of a shady area somewhere out of the elements could be under a roof would be a good idea you don't want it to keep getting rained on and then dry out keep getting rained on and dry out so take good care of it and uh, once we start reducing it down in about another week uh, we're going to start laying it right in the sun really trying to bake some of the moisture out then we can also use the fire to force some moisture out but at this point if you're ready to take a break take a break and if not well then we'll just keep moving on and uh, reducing mass off of these limbs getting something closer to bow shape because the more mass that is on this the longer it is going to take for this piece of wood to dry before we can turn it into a bow so if you're not in a rush you can just let it dry naturally over a period of several months or you can keep reducing it down so there's less and less and less wood to lose moisture all right it's been about a week I've just been super busy with work stuff. I haven't got a chance to, to work on it anymore, which is fine. We got it to that position that we could set it up and we didn't have to be right on top of it. And if you wanted to continue to work it down so it dries out a little bit faster, you know, probably shave a week off the build time, you can certainly have just worked on it straight through. But now what we're gonna do is, I wanted to show you looking down uh, the stave. What you wanna do is figure out where your tips are gonna be and it's gonna be, it's really simple. It's at the, the topmost peak of the crown of the stave. So it doesn't matter which side you look at, your tips are always gonna be at the very center, highest part of the crown. And the reason is, is even though you can look down the stave and say, well, it's got a little bit of wiggle off to the one side. What if I just move the, you know, the tip over here to make it in a straight line? Well, then the problem is, is if you move if you're trying to make absolutely perfect and get a, a really straight line as opposed to following the crown of the stave naturally, number one, you're gonna have excessive grain run out on one side and then on this side, your tip's gonna lean because if you go off to the side, you're gonna put twist in it. So always go just simply straight off the top of the crown. All right, so we're still just running the antler chisel, but now we're gonna start working on the sides. And we'll thin down along the grip a little bit more <clears throat> through here, but then also in this area, what they call the fades. And then we don't have to go super narrow by the tips. They'll probably go somewhat narrow, but you know, a lot of your oh, more Cherokee style bows or southeastern style bows actually don't have a ton of taper. So we're just going to let this work out organically. And probably as we split and work off pieces of this, it's going to naturally start to give it more of a parallel limb shape. So we're just gonna build this thing organically and let it see how it wants to turn out. So there's not a whole lot of, I think, exciting instruction at this point. It's more so, uh, we gotta shim this up a little bit so it doesn't bounce. It's gonna be kind of the same story that we did before. It's just removal of wood. So gonna get the chisel up under it start tapping it in place and we want to make sure that we don't get out of control with a lot of our wood removal uh, and dig into the back too far or pull something that wants to twist but this piece is it's pretty straight and uh, it doesn't have a lot of uh, grain twist in it so I don't think we have to worry about that too awful much so we're just going to keep working through just like we have been. It's just wood removal is all it is. And again, now <clears throat> you may be wondering, could you just drive in this way and split it down? And you might be able to, except for it's rather, we don't actually want to remove a ton of material. And if you get too big of a bite, your limb's gonna get way too narrow, way too fast. And we don't actually need to take a ton off of the width of this. So make sure you keep going back and checking to make sure that you're actually not biting in too deep, getting too aggressive with it, because we want the limbs to be a little bit wide. We just want to flatten out some of the, the crown on the sides of the bow. There's a good, a good peel. Just be careful when you peel. Make sure it's following the grain, which it is. It's following it perfectly. But that peeling is just a great way to remove larger amounts of wood so keep that in mind that's the, like the number one takeaway on this especially 
working something like hickory. This is why natives in this area, in many areas, will work hickory because it's a very elastic wood and it's a very hard wood, but the grain peels. See what I'm doing here is what I'm actually working. I'm not trying to, to work up a splinter as much as I'm just trying to even out and catch any splinters that aren't lifted up there are easy to get. So these is probably fine. I was just checking it. It's kind of smoothing it out. But anyway, their hickory is a very elastic wood and a very uh, hard wood, but it will split and peel fairly easily. So, you know, down here in, in, uh, in Florida, they did work stuff like cypress because it's a soft wood and in the Pacific Northwest they would use yew wood because it's quite soft and and then in the Midwest they would use Osage and believe it or not Osage is not well not only is it probably the best wood in the world but it's uh, it has great not only great elastic properties but great peeling properties and splitting properties as well, actually better in my opinion than hickory. So most people aren't used to watching hickory split like this, but they're also not used to using Stone Age tools on it. Now compare that to a very comparable wood to hickory, at least in performance, would be elm or hop hornbeam, but if you use a piece of elm, the grain interlocks and it makes a, a, a great bow and a very strong bow, but to try to peel it, you'll never peel a piece of elm because the grain just interweaves. You have to chisel off every single bit of elm wood. And that's why, it's not that it's not a good bow wood, it is, but it's so difficult, so, so difficult to work with Stone Age tools. So that's why hickory, is actually a very good bow wood, not only for its elasticity, but its ease, ease of use, even though it's a hardwood, very hardwood, its ease of use in working with stone age or stone tools or antler tools or bone tools with stone age technology. Okay, so in between working on the sides, I'm still going back and working the belly down just the same exact way we did before. We're just getting up under it and working it. So I'm gonna kind of do a back and forth, back and forth on this, where I, yes, I do wanna keep working the sides down, but I also wanna work the belly down because we are still, I mean, very, very thick really out here. And I mean, we're kind of thick all over, but we're actually thicker out here now than we are up close to the handle, which is no good. You can probably see it's just slightly thicker. So I'm working progressively, just getting up under and peeling more wood. So I just wanted to mention that I'm going back and forth, going to the sides, to the belly. It's just a slow process, but make sure that you're not in a rut where you just keep removing wood in the same spot because you're just going to get a big stupid dish and ruin your bow. So always make sure that when you're peeling stuff, you're looking where you're actually starting to remove it because if you just keep removing it from the same spot, obviously you're going to run into a problem. So I just wanted to make sure I at least touched on that and then you can see how <clears throat> you have some of these abrupt spots here you don't really like those and I don't like them not only will I continue to just split and remove this material I can come in from this side too and obviously knock it off that's not that big of a deal that easy peasy well, that's a nice chunk, but this is a good side here to show you, and I'll flip it around just to show you, because this one I'll just remove a little bit more material, but once you start getting it down to where there's not much left, then it's pretty much a straight, you're not going to start over here to remove the material, you're just going to start feathering it down in, so you're just quite literally just chiseling off little pieces as you go
steady as she goes. So we're almost there. I got just a little bit more to do. I'll just go ahead and knock that off. And then we are at a point in which we can actually start trying to force dry this because we're, we're at a floor tillering stage, but we can't floor tiller it right now because it's still, it's still too green. It's still too wet. We'll make the bow take uh, set or string follow by doing that. So we're going to force some of the moisture out of this. So let's go ahead. We'll fast forward a little bit. It's getting dark now, so we'll do it tomorrow. But this is the point that we're at. We'll set it up and let it uh, dry itself out. See you in the morning. Hey guys, thanks for joining me in the teepee this morning. It's uh, probably one of the last cool mornings we're going to have here in Florida. And I have something here that's really special that I want to share with you. And this is an original bow from Papua New Guinea. And I got this almost 30 years ago now. It's not been quite 30 years, but we are getting awfully darn close to it being 30 years since I've got this and the set of arrows that go with it. And it doesn't anymore. It has a, still a very, very faint smell of smoke. But I remember vividly how much the bow and arrow set just radiated a smoky smell. And that is because in their huts that they lived in, it's stored up in the ceiling in the rafters and there's a fire going that they're cooking in and uh, it's being stored up there collecting that smoke but also outside of that collecting the smoke it's also being subject to a lot of heat and so when you're talking about living in a in a primitive style of shelter be it a, a teepee be it a, a wiki up be it you know, a hut somewhere else by different names, and you're running a fire inside, you are hyper drying everything that is inside of that structure. And so, especially in a jungle setting, or even here in the east or southeast, where it's extremely humid, we have to realize that these people were living in structures that were actually being dried on the inside almost year round by their fires. And why that's also important is the bow that we're working on is a piece of hickory and hickory has a reputation of sucking up moisture taking on set or string follow and not being the best bow wood however it was used on a regular basis but we have to remember that the peoples that were using them didn't just take it and leave it on the porch or leave it in the house or wherever that was subject to certain amounts of moisture fluctuations that they were quite literally coming home to their shelter hanging it up somewhere, even in a, even in a teepee setting, you could hang it onto the, the side of these poles very, very easily, and it would be drying out all the time. Now in the western states, you could run into a problem where if you're doing that, you could actually get the bow way too dry and break it. Uh, hickory is very, very tough to do that with, but there are other woods that you can get too dry. But when we're talking about using a hickory bow, they probably performed a lot better on average than the bows that we make today simply because they were being stored in a manner that kept them very, very dry. And while it can keep your finished bow very dry at the same time, if you, especially if you were the bow maker in your little community, that you would have a shelter that has several bow staves or bows in progress at the same time and that's going to help dry them out as being in the structure with a fire going even a very very small fire in a primitive shelter just a small kindling fire very very small fire will warm it up and dry out a shelter very very fast so that's something that's really important and that's why I wanted to show this to you because it is very very significant for primitive cultures and building and maintaining their bows now because i don't live in this tp all the time and i don't have a fire going it's not going to be super dry in here right now it's sitting on top of grass which is just going to be full of moisture you know if you lived in here all the time and it turned into a dirt floor essentially then you wouldn't uh, you would have a lot more of that drier um, airspace in here as opposed to if I be, even if I build a fire in here now it's just going to suck the moisture out of the grass and keep bringing it up for a, you know a week or so until they've dried it out now that being said I'm not going to dry this in here because I don't live in this teepee all the time and so I'm not in here to maintain a fire I'm not sleeping in here there's not 
uh, there's no reason for me to keep it in here. In fact, it'll probably gain moisture because it's just going to be in a shady area that's not being dried by the fire. So what we're going to do is we're going to do it outside by a fire, which is also important because if you do live in an area like Florida, especially in the summertime, you're not going to have a fire inside of your primitive shelter. So, and a lot of your primitive shelters, quite honestly, down here would be more open airspace with just a roof over top. Now, it still is a great place to store your bows and arrows because they will help get dried by the sun on the roof and also any fire you do have that's raising heat into that roof space. But if you're not going to live in a cooler climate, we're going to do a lot of this drying of the wood outside around a long fire so instead of in the past I've made a fire and you can sit here and work it over and over and over but you have to babysit it and in this scenario we don't really want to babysit it so we're going to build more of a trench fire and then we're going to lean this up off to the side and we can just progressively get it closer till we find the sweet spot that it's drying the wood out without scorching the wood so follow along and let's go get that done all right so what we got going on here is just force your drying our bow stave and so you can see what I've basically done is I put the the bow up on a couple stakes or fork sticks or even some rocks is fine but I like to elevate it a little bit because if you elevate it it's going to capture a lot of the heat that's raising so if you put it really close to the ground you're not really running a lot of heat over it now what I'm really looking for in the fire is a very is a long fire just like this one it runs very parallel to the bow in itself and then once in a while I'll go over and I'll flip the bow around the other direction and you know just once every 10 15 20 minutes no big deal just as I'm outside working we'll go ahead and flip that around but I like to have a little bit of distance here this way I don't have to babysit it the whole time you can see I have a nice little bit of distance and I don't have any worry about scorching the wood. I don't want a big rip roaring fire, just steady. And you'll realize even at this distance where it's got probably two and a half to three feet from the bow to the fire, that that bow will get very hot, but it's not gonna get hot enough to scorch it. So as we get a hold of it, it's almost too hot to touch. And that's kind of what you're looking for. And then you know it's a good time to flop it around, but you'll be surprised even at this distance how hot that'll be and that's why you don't want a big rip roaring fire and that's why I don't put it right over top of the fire so all I'm trying to do is force dry this wood so I'm not looking to I'm not trying to heat treat the belly at this point I know many of you may be familiar with the heat treating uh, technology I've been heat treating bows for a few years and that's something that I may very well do on this one but I'm not going to be doing it now. We don't do that until the bow is nearly complete. At this point, all we are trying to do is suck some of the moisture out at a rapid pace. So as opposed to putting it in a shelter that just has a small fire in it that we're, we're hyper drying the piece of wood out, we're doing it this way with wood. And then one thing that I do like to mention is the rocks down at the bottom. You do not have to have the rocks. This is normally a fire pit that I have but I also stretch the rocks out and the reason I position it right over the rocks is the rocks hold heat so even as the fire dies down we're still radiating heat out of the rocks so and I will carry this process on for an entire day probably give you know not necessarily a day of rest but I will I'm not so worried it doesn't have to be for many days straight but I will force dry this piece of wood for several days before I ever start floor tillering it and as you work a piece of wood later on you will you will be able to tell if it still has moisture in it or if it's getting rather dry but we don't want to dry it so much that we end up breaking the dang thing either but we'll explain more of that in the future so anyway this is next step on it and it's going well we've just kind of been at this here for well about an hour now and we're gonna continue this pretty much all day Carrying on the process of drying it out, so getting about down to the end of the day. Burn this up and coming down every once in a while and feeling it. When it gets pretty hot, we rotate it around sometimes this way and sometimes we flip the whole thing around.
And pay attention to what way the wind's blowing too. You don't want to be blowing the flame right up on your stave, but it gets pretty hot, almost too hot to touch sometimes. That's what you're looking for. Don't want to scorch it to death, just want to dry it out. All right, day two on this one. As far as I'm concerned, you can't really run too much moisture out of a piece of hickory, especially early on, because we're going to give it a couple days to naturalize itself anyway once we're done heating it out. So we're just keeping it hot pretty much all day long and just running every bit of moisture out of this thing that we can get. So we want this thing as dry as we can possibly get it. And then if, when we start working it down, if it's still not dry enough, we'll heat it some more. It's actually been a couple days and last night I actually got impatient. I wanted to work on it. So quite frankly, I just sat inside the house. It was after dark and I scraped on it because it's a long process and there's no way I'll be able to sit and show you the whole dang process of now cleaning up a limb like this that we've chopped and stripped the pieces off and then scraping it down into actually a pretty nice limb. Now this isn't done yet but it is a heck of a lot nicer than that side that's all squared off and blocky and also very very thick. And So this is kind of floor tillered on this side here which I'll explain some of that in the future here as well. But for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to take a rock. These are the two that I've used thus far. I'll bring them in here closer for you to see. And the importance is, if you watched my um, woodworking tool video, you want like these, I mean it's not a true 90 degree per se, but these more 90 degree, and you can actually see quite a bit of the, the wear that's on these. So these are actually getting kind of dull now. Uh, I can still use them, but they're... I've used these two on the other limb, and so I have a fresh one here. And it's interesting because, see that's the edge I'm going to use right there. The You almost have to relearn how to use every single tool. So I'm actually going to start off with one that I'm fairly comfortable with. And the reason I like these blocky ones is because I can get my hand on them a little bit easier. And they don't wear me out as much. But now what you don't want is, and I don't even have one here to show you, is stuff that has like the, the really sharp little knife edges on it because if you're trying to work and scrape with those, they just crumble and break. You don't get any edge life out of those thin little blades. Those are for like skinning and fine detail work. This makes a perfect scraper. And as I get closer into this, I'm going to bring the camera in to show you how it scrapes and actually how well it scrapes. And you can see some of what's coming up. But one thing to really point out is all the places that have like the chop marks and the peel marks, it's very inconsistent. It seems like you'll scrape on it forever and it just doesn't really come smooth. It seems like it's you're just going to be here for absolute ever. And it's not because once you get past that really choppy layer and it starts to smooth out, like on this side, you actually can remove these beautiful curls of wood because it doesn't have that choppy resistance or, or uh, that constant in and out. It's like it's just like chattering across the edges. So you'll see what I mean as we move on. You get some really nice flakes. You know, this side really scrapes smooth and I can remove nice wood where this side you can hear it, how it's kind of across it. And you just got to get through all of that. Now, when you start having these lines, I'm going to bring the camera in now so I can start explaining this to you a little bit. So hang tight. All right, so you can see I've already scraped some of this here, but you see kind of the wavy lines compared to this side. You can see how much nicer that is. So these wavy lines, they, they don't scrape super nice. And if you actually keep following like all these little spots that we jam the chisel down in, if you keep following them, they'll keep chattering. So what we're going to do is we actually turn the tool a little bit at an angle this way and then at this way and we'll just keep working back and forth so we're not pulling we're not pulling straight in all the time but we'll turn it a little bit and we'll we'll pull this way and we'll turn it because now we're actually planing across those divots evenly as opposed to hitting them and keep falling down in those if that makes sense so like right now I'm kind of working it towards me and it doesn't matter which direction you use just whichever way removes the wood the best. So right now away from my body is working really good. There's other instances where pulling it to you works really well. 
There you can see some of the wood removal coming off of that, I think, hopefully. I'm gonna go ahead and try that new one. It's a little bit sharper. Oh yeah, that's gonna be really nice here. Let's see if we can't get up here close. You can maybe see some of the curls that are gonna come off that. So that's a nice new sharp one right there. And again, same thing, you don't always wanna pull this way. Tilt it a little bit and change the angles on some of these. Now the reason that I use an edge, now this one I'm actually going to have to be careful of, I may have to switch at some point. Um, I can try this side too, actually. The reason I don't use a napped end scraper is because all it does is leave all these grooves and lines in here. And you can remove some material, but these flat edge remove material very, very well. And it almost shaves the wood as opposed to just raking out like a toothing plane. So I've always used these for my wood scraping. Kind of a different story when it comes to hide scraping and stuff, but for woodworking, I like a nice smooth scraper. And you can do the sides as well with this. So all these rip outs where we were peeling the pieces, we're just gonna do the same thing and we're just gonna scrape those right out. Now it doesn't take that long to actually get it smooth. So you'll sit here for maybe an hour and you could have the bow mostly smooth, but that's only a little piece really of the equation because then we gotta get it to the point where the limbs start to bend and that'll be the next part I show you. So make sure that you watch into the next part before completing this yourself because you don't wanna scrape too far or not enough, but as of right now, I'm just gonna keep on scraping. You're gonna be a couple hours into this, like I said. And then we can, we'll skip ahead here in a second and I'll show you how our other limb over here is actually starting to bend. All right, so now into this, what we call floor tillering in the process. And, and we're still really heavy, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you see how we're starting to bend? And you can tell I, I really still have probably too much bend right in here. So here's the handle and I push and you can see it's, it is bending mostly in here so I do need to take a little bit more off the tips but right now this is actually very stout. I mean we got this wood very dry around the fire. Now this side's the one that we just started scraping and it's definitely stiffer yet so you can actually see the top limb. Let's do that. You can see the top limb is bending a little bit more we need to just keep working this down. But it's actually not as far off of this limb as I thought. So by the time we clean all this one up, I think we might be in okay shape. But yeah, this one's pretty stout still compared to this one. But that's floor tillering. And it's gonna take a little bit of practice to get an eye for it. And you don't wanna force it real far. You're just trying to test to see where it starts to bend. And once it's completely floor tillered, which we'll show you later, once I get it to that point, is we're going to bend it far enough that we're comfortable putting a string on the bow. Then once we have a string on the bow, we'll continue the tillering process. But as of right now, we still have a lot more work to do in scraping and refining this one out. So we're just going to keep doing that for the rest of the evening. So I'll catch up with you tomorrow. Process of floor tillering is going really, really well. And last night, I cut that knock in. So now I'm gonna show you how I did it. I'm gonna make one that looks just like this. I went with a classic diamond shaped knock inspired by some of the Cherokee bows. And there's also a little bit of a reason why we went with the diamond shaped knock because we're working with stone tools and it's fairly easy to make this. So all of that, even some of those look like they're almost pretty darn clean cuts, don't they? And it's all with a stone knife. So let's show you how to do that quick. All right, so this is the back of the bow. You can still tell because it's dirty. It doesn't matter which side you really start on it. I add a little bit of angle back, but not a whole lot. What we want to do is really look and decide where we want our knock to be. And we can go ahead and score it 
with the knife. Now that's my one of my Bison Skinner knives and this one I have used uh, exclusively just for tool work. So I use it for wood and bone and antler. I've cut all kinds of stuff with this on my videos in the past. And so it's gotten a little bit, a little bit smaller over a period of time as I sharpen it down a little bit. And it works usually best just drawing it back to yourself. You can saw with it some. Every material you work with uh, responds a little bit differently to the sawing action. This one wants to it wants to work pretty okay with it. The other side, it, I almost exclusively had to back drag the whole thing. So now, after we start cutting a groove in here, like this. We're not going to be able to just cut straight down because the knife runs out of room. So if you see me cut with stuff before, I go like this with the knife that wallows it out. But the thing is, we need to come down here pretty far, and that's just not going to get us there. So then what we're doing is coming up about well, where, where the little tip of our side of our diamond knock would be. And we're going to do it again, but this time we're angling back into... So this way we're just going to progressively keep working and chewing everything out. Typically, when I did the other one last night, the entire knock took me about an hour to do. Not just, not just one, like I mean the whole knock, both sides and the edges. So it's not that long of a process with these stone tools. I think like it would take a lot longer. Alright, see now once it's kind of bottomed out and it's causing a lot of friction and you can't really remove as much material, then you're just going to go right here in the center between your two notches that you made. So I can show you that here quick. Alright, so this one's going straight in and then this one, so you can see it's angling back in just a little bit. Well now we're just going to go in and chew out all that stuff in the middle. And you can do it almost pretty much always change the direction and you'll chew through this stuff really fast. So now I'm just basically taking, I went back down straight again and now I'm working this angle back and I'm meeting kind of in the middle, I'm not necessarily in the middle but down at the bottom. So just continue that process a little bit more, we'll go a little bit deeper, and we'll be ready to do the other side. I've got about five minutes wrapped up in this one so far, I'll probably have another five minutes until I get it where really where I like it. But we're able to remove pretty good material with one of these bison skinner knives that I call them. The reason I call them bison skinner knife is because I put the uh, several of these together when we went and did the bison documentary and that's what we skin the bison with. Alright, so that one's almost done. I'm going to clean it up just a tiny bit more. And then we'll show you go ahead and chew in this end off. But for the most part, it's just removal with, with this knife. You're using it as a saw, per se. And then here's the one that's already done. A little dirty now because we've crammed it in the ground while I'm working. That's pretty normal for me. No big deal. So, it's going to look like that about the time it's said and done. But I don't think I need to really show you how to do every little scrape on this thing, but how you're going to get the other side of your diamond is the same exact way. You're just going to choose the angle, score the line, like this, and then we will um, just saw this through and take chunks out until you completely cut that off the other side. It's pretty much that simple. It's just cutting with a stone knife.
see how far we're actually getting down into that pretty far so that's it and then of course once you have created that groove we'll come in on the side of it I'll show you that here in a second So then once we created the groove down, then I'm going to come in the side, and you can't really pry with a stone knife, but you can give a little bit of lift up on it. You don't want to pry, you just want to lift. And just a little bit, not too much. Peeled a little there, no big deal. And that opens it up so now you can cut some more. And then we're basically just going to continue that same process until it's completely cut off. Now, you can see how how uh, far along. I mean, we're halfway through it already, and it's only just been um, about two minutes. So that's it. I think that's probably sufficient enough to show you on the knocks and how we're going to do it. It's not going to be terribly exciting. It's just sitting and cutting. But again, the end goal is going to be to work it down to where it looks like this one, minus all the dirt that I crammed down in it. But that's what we're looking for. Alright, once we're floor tillered, what we're doing is we're putting on a, a string. And this is a sinew bowstring that I made. And I skipped that process because it's actually a, a whole process all in itself. And right now it's long in case we need to adjust it. So with our knocks cut in the way they are. And then this is, it's basically I tie it off to where it's about four to five inches short. So when we string it, the bow is somewhat... Uh, strung up at least close to the brace height that we're looking for but it doesn't have to be exact now we can always undo the the bowyer's knot or the bow line knot depending on which knot you use but I have a video on making a sinew bowstring I would like to say it's an oldie but a goodie but it's not really a goodie it's mostly just an oldie but it does show you how to make a sinew string and then also I have a video on how to make a rawhide bowstring so I will drop that down in the description so if you need to learn how to make a bowstring from natural materials, you can go do that, but we'll skip it because I already have a video on that. So then, once this is put on and then we floor tailored it as best as we possibly can. Now also keep in mind that I do this for a living. So whenever I floor tailor one, I kind of know what I'm looking at usually more than the average person does. So when you first string your bow up, it may not look quite as good as mine. Hang on and we'll, we'll look it over a second. So I do a step through method and you can also find that on my YouTube channel, but on a natural bowstring always let the tension up a little bit nice the first time. There we are, we're strung up and you can see the tiller on my bow is actually not too bad. It's pretty even so far. Now what you may find is that one side bends a lot more where the other is more straight. And if the side that's more straight, or if you have a spot that doesn't look like it bends at all, that's where you need to remove more material. But getting it to this point can actually be a little bit dangerous because if you, if you don't floor tiller very well and you try to string the bow, then what happens, you could accidentally break the bow before you ever even put a string on it and start tillering. Now in the tillering process in itself, that's a big long process. And I'll walk you through a little bit of it, but I can't cover every teeny tiny little step along the way just simply because you'll be bored to death. But as I show you the tillering and what needs to happen and how we remove wood to make it bend very, very symmetrically on both sides is what we're looking for. You don't want one limb 
that bends a lot more. You don't want one spot in the limb that does all the bending in a straight piece over here. What you're looking for is a very elliptical tiller as you draw this bow back, which it's too heavy, I can't draw it like this. When you draw the bow back, it should bend very evenly in elliptical shape. And that's what's gonna be a good tiller. And if it doesn't have that good tiller, then there's a very, very good chance that your bow is going to break. So the tiller of the bow, meaning its elliptical shape, is exceptionally important. And if you need to know more about that, again, look down in the description and I'll put a link to my book, Primitive Bow Building. It'll teach you everything you need to know, whether you're doing it with stone tools or modern tools, it doesn't matter. The process of tillering is the same in bow making. That stuff's very, very important. Now I have not fully tillered this bow. It is only to a point in which I felt comfortable bracing it, which means putting a string on it in which I've got uh, not even, it's probably pretty close to the true brace height of the bow that I want at primitive bows. I don't like to have a, a super high brace height, probably uh, five to six inches, give or take. <clears throat> now, when you want to tiller the bow and you're trying to guess on the you're not trying to guess but you're trying to see how the limbs bend you, you kind of have two options if you're working in a more modern setup you're going to have something what we call a tiller tree in which you can stand back and you can actually observe and you could certainly build a primitive tiller tree as well or you can have a friend and if you're in a primitive setting you should have a whole village around you so there's nothing wrong with having a friend that can very slowly and you may need to make sure that you let them know that they draw the bow back a piece at a time so you either put an arrow on or not even an arrow it doesn't have to be an arrow but just a string that's got an or a, I'm sorry a string a stick that has a string knock cut in it that you can put on the arrow and they don't have to be exact one inch increments but what we're going to do is do so many increments out until you hit your actual draw length, which is as far as you draw the bow back. But if we just pull this back right now, very, very, very high chance that it's going to break because we haven't done any tillering. And so what we need to do is very slowly, and I usually start with a couple inches like this. And once you stand back and watch how the limbs bend, you can remove material. Now, I'll back up enough so hopefully you can see some of how this bow actually bends and I will point out on the camera where it looks a little stiff and where we may need to remove some material. So I'm sure it's not perfect to that draw length, but I felt pretty good. So hopefully let's go over and you've probably seen me put on the screen something that says, oh, we're gonna move, remove material there. And uh, I'll go back and I'll watch it and I'll look at it. Um, and then I'll remove that material and show you. Basically, we're just gonna scrape that little bit. We don't scrape a ridiculous amount. We just scrape enough until that bit of wood, say, if I had to take a guess, and standing back and looking at this bow, I would say it probably needs to bend, I bet you a little bit right here, and maybe, maybe a skosh here, and maybe a teeny tiny bit right there. That's just from my eye, and that's another way of tillering, is looking at how the bow is shaped when it's braced. You want it very, very even. And then what you can do, and this is more, the rudimentary way of tillering. It's not as accurate, but if you're all by yourself or in a survival situation, or <clears throat> you simply don't have the tillering mechanisms, is you pull it back so far and you keep track of how many lines you've drawn to. So I would say, okay, well I've drawn to here, and now what I'm doing is I'll draw that maybe, maybe 15 or 20 times, over and over and over. And then I'll look at the tiller of the bow while it's braced and if the if it looks like it's a little stiff in a spot I'm gonna remove material in those spots and then once it's looking pretty good again now okay well we had to four lines now the next time I'll pull to five lines and I'll do that all 15 or 20 times or so 
and then I'll look at it again. Has anything changed? And you can make just these small adjustments as we go until you get to a point that you can pull the bow all the way back. And so, of course, I have a fairly short draw length anyway. I only shoot about 22 inches on a bow like this, so this bow is actually pretty stout. Um, you may find that your bow is obviously longer and may not be as heavy at this short of a draw length, but that's all kind of a different story for a different day. All that stuff, again, is included in my bow making book. So, hopefully, in understanding, I'm trying to do this so you can see it a little bit, hopefully, it'll start allowing you to understand the tiller of a bow and then remove the material. And once we find these places in which the material needs to be removed, I always tend to put my thumb on it or my finger whenever I'm done looking at it so I don't uh, forget where it is or look at different features of the woods like little pin knot clusters or something and I know it's right between these two little pin knot chevrons nothing severe we're just going to take our little scraper again and we're not trying to hog a ridiculous amount of wood out but we're just going to take a few good scrapes out of here and at this point it's very minute work if you sit here and work on this for 15 minutes you will inevitably remove too much material and if you remove too much material the rest of the bow has to be scraped down to meet this one weak point so we're just going to scrape a little bit i would say right not too much more a little bit and then we're going to be ready to check it again right there that's a pretty good number now i'll step back and we'll check it again all right another little point that i needed to make sure that i pointed out is when you have the string on the bow and it's probably very very difficult for you guys to see at home and you'll know what i mean whenever you do it there's a very good chance that when you string it up that the string is going to favor one side of the bow and that means when you look down the end of the nox the string actually favors one side and it leans off. A lot of times the limbs naturally curve one way or another and I've seen where many people spend a ridiculous amount of time trying to correct that where the string will track perfectly right down the center of the limb. But the problem is is that's actually a good thing. You want it to favor one side of the bow because that makes it easier to shoot different arrow spines off of this bow. And if you don't know anything about arrow spines, well then that's uh, gonna have to be a, another video for another day. But anyway, when you have the string that naturally favors one side and it favors this side of the bow, I think you can actually see it here, that it makes the arrow, let's show it here like this. It doesn't make the arrow stick out as far as opposed to if we put it on this side. You see how far the arrow sticks out if we try to hold the bow up and down, straight up and down, and you see how far the arrow actually points off to the one side compared to when we do it and it's actually a little straighter up and down this way. That means the string favors this side and by putting the arrow on the side that the string favors, it's going to allow it to be more forgiving per the arrow that it likes to shoot. Meaning, it's not going to be nearly as finicky and you can get away with shooting a lot different arrows off of it. It's very important. So that's what's going to dictate your top limb versus your bottom limb. All right, now once you're actually happy with how the tiller looks when you're pulling it back, and it's probably not perfect yet at this point, but I'm pretty happy with it at my draw length. I'll still adjust it a little bit, but we're actually going to give it a couple days to naturalize and normalize to the, to the environment. So we're going to give it a couple days before we remove any more material. We can shoot it a little bit, and then we'll go back and we'll really perfect the tiller as we want. But then we go ahead and check the tiller and draw it back to your draw length, which, like I said, I don't usually hold upright and then draw back to here like modern archers do. I'm more of a shoot in front and camp the bow, so my draw length's very short. So for me to hold it like this and pull it back is very unnatural to me. But you can see how the limbs are bending, which really is not too awful bad. So, 
once you're happy with them, then as long as you have an arrow, you're ready to shoot. All right, so now's a good time. If you need to tighten up your string, what we'll do is we'll unstring it, we'll actually take it off the top, and we, we can twist it, obviously, the, when you twist it tighter, and you'll know because when you let go, it unravels. Twist it tighter, we'll start with four or five turns at a time, and then bend it and put it back on. And that will raise your brace height. So in case you need to have a little bit more distance in between here, that's how you're gonna tighten it. But you can't go crazy with it, but you can gain about a half an inch or so. Now, keep this in mind too. If you unstring your bow and it carries some natural arc to it, like the limbs aren't super straight, then that is something that we call set and that is very normal especially with a hickory bow this stave is only all told two and a half weeks old which is insane that i was able to take this bow that's i'm gonna guess 58 inches long i think maybe yeah probably about 58 i didn't even measure it 58 inches long and I'm drawing a 22 inch draw on it and it's fully tillered to 22 inches. It's not a perfect draw because we're not perfected. This is all the amount of set that it took and that is the and that only reason is is because we force dried it over a fire. So that's not the best way to do it in my opinion, but there is something we can do in the future to help speed that process up. Um, not speed it up, but help even counteract a little bit of the set. But you have to remember when you're looking at a bow like this. If it's got this much bend in it when you're said and done, that's not bad, especially for a hickory bow. This was a straight limb. It was about as straight as could be. And even after tillering, I only have maybe an inch of set or string follow. That's it, hardly any at all. Now, if your bow, when you take the string off, it just stays bent, it still had way too much moisture in it. And unfortunately, the damage is done. You will be able to correct maybe a little bit of that by bending it back straight and then drawing a little bit more moisture out of it over a fire. But all in all, it's the, the belly fibers are already stressed and compressed and they'll probably never fully rebound back from that. But on this one, we did pretty good job drying it out. And for a hickory bow in Florida, that's, I literally cut this tree two and a half weeks ago and then dried it for two days over a fire. That is pretty darn good for set and string follow. In fact, that's really good. And if I had to take a guess, I'll weigh all this stuff later. I think it feels about 55 pounds at 22 inches where I draw the bow to. And of course, make sure to keep following along with uh, some of these Stone Age how-tos that we do because I have a video. I'm not exactly sure what it's gonna be called, but it's kind of the context of primitive archery. Uh, that's gonna be coming up in the future and if it's already out i'll go ahead and drop a link um, if you're watching this shoot a year later or so but we're going to talk about the importance of uh how all of this intertwines in real primitive archery how primitive peoples actually did it's a pretty interesting thing but let's continue on with the build because we're not quite done yet so anyway here we are and if you needed to see building arrows for this, I'll drop a link down in that description. I've got, I've got uh, how to build the arrows. I've got how to build the stone points. Anything you can need. This is a whole Stone Age build series. And everything that I have in these series, as I clump them all together, I'll make a playlist even on YouTube. But I'll put links down in the description. And hopefully you'll be able to find these other videos on my Hunt Primitive YouTube channel. Because we have so many videos showing you everything. A to Z from the sinew string or a rawhide string to building the bow to making the arrowheads to making the arrows to going and hunting with them. We have all kinds of stuff going on. So make sure you check all that stuff out and subscribe if you're not doing that already. But let's continue on with this build because I tell you what, we're almost done. In fact, right now, you're probably wondering a little bit about the little pigtail hanging off the end. And I'm just going to let you know what we're going to do is once we've got this bow completely done, I'm not going to cut it off yet. I'm actually going to wrap this around a couple times. So you don't want to cut it off yet because I already know somebody's thinking, man, I'm just going to go cut that off because now my string's the length that I want to leave it long because your string may, may work back and forth a little bit. Leave this pigtail on until we're completely, this will be like one of the last things you do 
and I will wrap it around and I'll tie it on. That way we always have a little extra if we need it because we may build another bow if something ever happens to this one and you might be able to reuse the string. So that's just a little tip for you in the future. And then also when we tie this on, it'll help keep the string from ever falling off the bottom knock and undoing some of your twists that you preloaded into it just to uh, increase your brace height and decrease your string length. So anyway, let's continue on because I'm getting really excited and really I just want to go shoot because this bow is turning out so, so good so far. So now what we're looking at is it's been about a week and I've been shooting the bow and I really enjoyed the tiller. Well, after not only a little while of shooting the bow in and testing it, but also some normalizing with the uh, humidity and the climate, you're gonna have some spots that maybe reabsorb some moisture, some other spots that are losing moisture. So your tiller is kind of bound to change just a little bit. And so that's why it's important that after a few days or a week, even after two weeks, you go back and you look at the tiller again. You make sure you're looking at it at the brace and see if anything's getting out of tiller a little bit because that can be harmful to your bow down the road. And then adjust it, re-tiller the bow and get it as perfect as you want to be. And that's why I didn't put a finish on the bow yet. So after we've shot it for a little while and we're seeing some places that maybe the tiller needs adjusting, like now I'm getting to a point where it looks like it's bending a little bit more here than it is up here. See what I'm talking about, just a little bit. Not exactly sure how that looks on camera to you, but at least whenever I sit back and watch it, I can see I have more bend here and we're going to run into where this limb is going to be overstressed over a period of time. It'll start taking more set, potentially have a catastrophic failure, probably not, but it may. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and the same thing I did before. You can see that there's a bit of a flat section right here, especially, and then a little bit right here. And so I'm just going to continue to scrape and retailer this bow until I have a nice perfect arc on both sides that's very consistent throughout the draw. So that's what we're going to do is revisit. We're just going to scrape it down and then get it perfect. But I brought along another bow and I wanted to introduce you to this one. This is a, a bow that I made with stone tools about I would say six maybe seven years ago and it's made out of a piece of hickory and a sinew string. Oh, by the way, I didn't show you building the sinew string uh, because I have another video on that and I will link that in the Stone Age series and down in the description. And I would like to say it's an oldie but a goodie, but it's not really a goodie, but at least it shows you how to build a sinew or a rawhide bowstring for that matter. So anyway, with this bow, and that's the string I actually built for this bow is the one you're gonna see in that video. Same exact string, it's lasted me all these years. It's such a, it's such a, a robust string material even though it's, it's primitive. But anyway, in building this, and I've hunted and I've taken game with this bow, I work this with stone tools and the piece of wood had a little bit of moisture in it still and it took on a little bit of set and so I went through and I did a heat tempering, a really good heat tempering on the belly. You can see how it's kind of toasted in here. And that brought a little bit of life back in the bow. Now, oddly enough, our new bow that we made actually shoots harder than this one that was heat tempered. And one thing I wanted to make mention of with heat tempering, I'm not saying I won't heat temper that other bow at all, but several years ago, I was still heavy in the practice of heat tempering bellies on bows. And what I've learned throughout the years is when you heat temper, you're gonna gain what I call um, ghost poundage or ghost performance. And that is because we're hyper drying the piece of wood. We're drying it out over a heat source. And so we lose a lot of moisture and the bow becomes very heavy. It starts being very snappy. It starts seeing like, it is a really well performing bow. But now over a certain period of time, be it months, potentially even years, depending if you put a finish on the bow or not, it's going to absorb some of that moisture back in. Even if you put a sealer on the bow, it'll just absorb it slower. And so then what happens is once that bow has finally soaked up that moisture, you're almost right back to where you were before you heat tempered it. And so being that, because I've hunted with this bow a lot, we'll unstring it you can see that it does have some set, some string follow. And that's not a bad, it's not like a deal breaker. I mean, this is, 
you can see that it's got that. That's pretty normal, say, for a white wood or a hickory bow, especially in the east or southeast, is to have some of that, even with the heat tempering that we did on it. It's, it's tempered clear up the sides and everything. I really baked it out pretty good. We just lost a little bit of it over the years. So now with this bow, and I'm not saying it's a bad bow because it's absolutely not, it's a great bow, but with this one, I have no intention of heat tempering the belly unless I'm in a situation where I am trying to gain a little bit more poundage or if I'm trying to dry the bow out a little bit more before, before uh, sealing it. But at this point in time, this bow, even as is, shoots harder than this bow does and this one is they're pretty much about the same weight overall but i'm getting a little bit more power out of this one even though this one's heat tempered so it's not necessarily a fix-all for everything to go ahead and te heat temper it but you can gain a little bit of weight and performance out of it but what i'm trying to say is everything that you gain initially from heat tempering the belly on one of these bows you're not going to be able to keep all that you're not going to retain it so the moral of the story is if you take a bow like this that shoots really well without heat tempering, don't feel obligated to do it. If it shoots really good, it's a hard hitting bow, you stand more of a chance of actually messing it up by heat tempering it and end up running into a tiller problem. Now I have to re-tiller it, we lose more weight. Next thing you know, now you had a great bow, you went and heat tempered the whole dang thing and it turns into after you've adjusted it and heat tempered it now you're actually slower than you were before so be careful doing that kind of stuff but it is a good way to add a little bit more performance if your bow needs performance as of now this one doesn't but hang with me because after we retail it and we shoot it a little while longer you never know i might add it i might not i'll let you know probably in about another week or two so anyway i'm going to go ahead and retail this bow if all of that makes sense once I get the tiller where I really like it, I'm gonna keep shooting it. And when the tiller finally starts to be stable and you don't see any more changes in the tiller at all, not in the brace, not in the tiller, and a week has gone by and there's been no changes, then you're ready to finally finish your bow. All right, now once we've gotten down to a point that we're actually really happy with the tiller of our bow and we don't wanna make any more adjustments, everything seems stable, now's the time but you can find a little flake like this one. So it's kind of got that 90 degree little break edge on it. And if you have any place that you need to clean up, we're not removing massive amounts of material here, but what we'll do is we'll just gently scrape any sort of tooling marks out that you have that you want to get rid of. We're not trying to make any major corrections at this point, we're just cleaning it up. This is finish work. And so we'll go over the entire bow with just a little tiny flake, clean up any like your square edges. We can go ahead and round those off a little bit, make those look nice. And by the time we're done with this, we'll be just ready to pick up something like a deer antler or a bone. And we're gonna do what we call burnishing and that's where we just take the round edge and we're gonna rub it vigorously over every bit of surface area on this bow that we possibly can. And what that's going to do is that's going to like compress the fibers and help with a little bit of moisture resistance as well as make the belly and the back fiber. So we're going to do the entire bow a little bit stronger and that'll also keep the grain from rising a little bit if it does get wet, but we can add a finish after this if we would like. Now, that other bow that I introduced you to, that actually has no finish on it whatsoever. That is bare wood. I have never put any sort of finish on that other bow. And it's done just fine, it's done very well. And um, even to this day, I have no problem taking it out and hunting and killing animals with it. However, when you rub your hand across it, you can tell because it has gotten wet a few times that the grain is raised and it's got a rather rough feel. Now, it's not the end of the world. You can leave the bow perfectly as is if you would like. If you want to maintain a smoother feel, then we can apply a finish. And the finish can also aid in slowing down the absorption of uh, humidity in the air, but what it can also do is also slow down the expelling of that moisture as well. So if you expose it for long periods of time into a very humid climate, it will then take longer for it to dry out. So it's just gonna slow down the fluctuation of the humidity or the moisture content of the wood. So keep that in mind. 
But if we're talking about, again, primitive peoples who are going to be storing their bow in, uh, say, the rafters of their shelter, their hut, or whatever it is they live in, it's going to maintain uh, a level of lower moisture than it would say the average person that's just going to take this in their house and lean it up against the wall so if you do i'm assuming pretty much everybody when they're done with this doesn't live in a hut especially if you're watching this video so you're going to want to try to actually keep it in a fairly dry location so not really your basements you know put it in your your living areas that's going to be your best option and then if you do have a room that happens to have a dehumidifier that's not a bad choice either so now i will literally sit and burnish this bow front back sides every piece of it for a couple hours and i'll just work over the whole piece of wood and you, and you kind of know when you have a rough spot still because you can feel the antler kind of grabbing you want to get it to where when you run it across it it feels like you're running it across a smooth surface and it's not grabbing a hold of the tool it's interesting as you try it out you'll understand but i'll do this for a couple hours mostly when i'm visiting with friends or from sitting around a fire enjoying a nice conversation because this can be taxing work but at the same time if your mind is occupied with something else much like I am right now when I'm talking to you I don't mind sitting and just burnishing a bow over and over and over and then that's something too that you can hand your kids and say here you play with this a little bit and and this is how we're gonna you know burnish this wood or your friends and you pass it around and everybody can kind of get a handle of it but uh but yep, so once you've got that kind of handled out, like I said, burnish it up for a couple hours and uh, get a, you'll get a really nice smooth finish. You'll, you'll understand after you've done it for a while, it won't feel super smooth. And then by the time that you are truly done burnishing this piece of wood, it'll be quite smooth. So I've actually done some of the, the bow already. I haven't done all of it, but some of it is. And it's quite smooth and it's quite nice. And it almost looks like it was really worked down with sandpaper even though it wasn't so make sure to burnish it if you want a nice finish at the end and if you want to apply a finish we're going to move on to that in the in the future i'm going to shoot it just a little bit more and make sure i don't want to heat treat the belly but as of right now it's doing so good i hate to do it to even risk it but sometimes you don't have to be in a rush you don't have to make that decision right away shoot the bow enjoy it and if it starts losing performance, if it starts getting a lot of set and you want to do that later on, there's nothing wrong with it. But as of right now, I'm really enjoying it, so I'm gonna go shoot it. All right, I originally wasn't going to put a leather grip on this bow, but I figured you probably wanna see me do it and wanna see the process that I would use. And then also it does serve two nice functions, one being it does keep the grip a little less slippery if it gets wet, especially with the finish that we're going to put on the bow in a little while. And then also we extend the leather out just far enough so when we hold it, the leather extends up above our hand and then that also uh, acts as a strike plate for the arrow because if you've ever shot an arrow off of a bare wood bow, when you pull it back you hear shh you hear the sound of the arrow coming across the wood bow. And if you have that little piece of leather sticking up out of the top, that muffles that sound. And that could be the difference in a really quiet evening of deer hunting and having a deer standing there and all of a sudden it hears it and it puts it on alert and it'll take off and run. So that's certainly happened before. So what I've got, and this is, this is brain tan leather, just a little extra strips from some of a uh, the other projects I always try to save a little bit of everything and then I've got some pine pitch on a stick a fire and the bow and there's no finish on the bow if you if you put a finish on here like a, some sort of oil finish or anything like we're gonna do later then it's not gonna stick very good but what I'm gonna do I should have been doing this already is I'm gonna set this by the fire but I don't want it over it where it's gonna get all sooty and black and that kind of stuff I like to keep it relatively clean and all we're going to do is just warm this wood so let me go ahead and let this warm for about five minutes or so and we don't want it really super hot but you want it where you touch it and it feels pretty darn warm and then we'll move on to the next step so give me a minute we'll be right back all right that's getting almost warm enough now what you do want to do is you want to pre-fit your piece of leather of course because you want to make sure that it does wrap around properly and fit so this way once it's already pre-fit 
then you just remember which side you started with and which side you want up and then that's what you're gonna stick with and that's what I'm gonna do and once you kind of wrap it and test it you'll understand how it wraps and everything it's not terribly difficult there's not much to it now what I'm going to do and the reason we're warming the wood it's pretty warm now is we're also gonna warm this pitch up and then we're going to we don't want to just make a big giant mess but we want to put pitch on this because if you don't glue the grip down it will spin on you like it won't be on there very tight it'll constantly be wanting to come undone it'll just be an absolute mess and so we want to put some pitch glue on here and you can use hide glue if you want but like I've said many times before I'm very much a pitch glue kind of person and it doesn't require pottery for me to use all the time I can just save it on these sticks and it's really quick quickly heat activated so we're we'll gonna go ahead and just coat that on pretty darn good right about where we want it we can always pick up some of the leather if we have to and slide it up under but for the most part I think we're got it right about where we want almost done okay that's pretty good now you want to heat this up again and that pitch will start to lay a little flat so you'll notice when you put it on it's a little bit messy it's going to lay a little bit flat go ahead and just heat that right up or it's a little bit messy and a little bit bumpy but as you heat it then it'll lay flat and you'll understand what I'm talking about when you do it then while it's still relatively warm you don't need it screaming hot make sure you've got your the correct side that you want to use on your leather I do so I'm gonna keep all right I'll use this side and I already kind of know where I'm laying it down and wanting to use it so I you kind of got to go a little bit quick because remember it's heat activated and I like to lay the pieces of leather next to one another and you're probably gonna get a little bit of pitch that squeezes out I try not to I did get a tiny bit there which stinks but it's not really the end of the world it's just aesthetics and I wrap this thing around yep got a little bit squeezed out there best thing you can do is if it squeezes out don't try to smear it off while it's wet because you'll smear it right into the leather. So go ahead and wait till it dries and then we can kind of pick it off a little bit. And if you do make a mistake, you can gently heat around the leather and pull it back off. That's, that's very doable. So once you really have gotten it where you want it, which I do, I like the way it looks right there, I think. It's pretty nice. I give it a couple... You can still feel that the uh, the pitch is soft, and that's once that really sets in there, it'll be locked in. So now's a good time. You can just work your little edges, make it nice, and I'll show you a picture of it when it's all said and done. Or not a picture, but I'll get the video up close to you. And what I might do is actually trim, take a stone flake and trim that just a tiny bit. I might do that. So that's what I usually do is just take a little stone flake and trim the last little bit. Let me make sure this is good before it sets. Working it through, see if you can pick off some of that other stuff. Just a little bit sticking up through, that's not the end of the world. But you know it's done the real way. And then you gotta remember too, that stuff's waterproof, so that's really good is if it does get wet or if you get the grip sweaty, uh, it won't detach it won't detach uh, the grip from from the handle. So I think that's pretty good. I like it where it's at. Alright, the bow's over here by the fire keeping the, the pitch kind of... Yeah, it's still tacky. So now what I'm going to do is now that I've lined out where I want it, I'm going to put a line with this sharp little flake. It'll cut it pretty easily. Just cuts right through it that easy. So then what we end up doing is we'll go back and we'll put just a little bit more pitch on that. 
Yep, that ought to be really good. In fact, I got a little bit more here than I still need, so I'm going to trim that. All right, so let me do that. Let me go ahead and heat this up again real fast. All right, got her heating up here pretty good. And I'm going to put a little bit just precisely right where I want it on the leather. And that'll help make it stick. And again, working kind of fast. Now what we're going to do is get a little pointed stick here. And I'm going to shove this corner right up under here. That makes sense to you. Almost. There we go. And now to really finish it off, we're going to put just another little dab of pitch right in there. Try not to make a mess of it. Going to make a little bit of a mess, not the end of the world. So we can pick a little bit of it off later. There we go. Very nice. And that'll hold pretty good, and if it doesn't hold, you can always just go back later and add a little bit more. In fact, I'm going to squeeze just a little bit under. There's a spot right there you can see. So I'm going to roll that back with my finger. Just a little bit of pitch in there. Try not to make a mess, but I'm doing it anyway. And like I said, that's what happens if you smear it while it's still wet. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Is that right? So once it's a little cooler, you can kind of pick it off. It's not so bad. Now, now what you need to do is anything you need to trim or whatever, do that. Put this back right around the fire and just warm the whole thing up again. And that will, that will soften all that pitch and then it'll set right into that leather anywhere that it was maybe a little bit uh, cool when you set it down and it didn't stick really good. Now of course as you hold this and you carry it, it'll soften that pitch ever so slightly. So the longer you sit and hold this, you know, while you're walking around hunting, it will soften up slightly, but it'll be so tacky it will not spin on you because the whole thing won't be heated, just the spots that you're holding. But just that alone will really, over time, it'll keep squeezing that pitch up into that leather and in that wood, and that'll be a very secure fit for years and years to come. And then, of course, the, the color of the handle will change as well as... Uh, it absorbs the moisture or the uh, oils from your hand. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and set this back over here by the coals and just heat that up and then that's it. It is completely done short of taking a little flake and maybe just cleaning up a little bit of this stuff for aesthetic reasons. But other than that, our handle's on and it was just that easy. All right, so in my pinch pot here, it's actually quite warm, so I'm not going to hold it very long. That is equal parts. And there's not a real scientific method I used to it. I'll stick it down here in front of me. It's equal parts beeswax, bear grease, and pine pitch. And I use all those for various reasons. I love that uh, the beeswax is more of the heat activated. The pine pitch uh, is definitely a great waterproofing and also dries a little bit harder. And then as we heat it up and work it, the bear grease can work down in the wood a little bit. And I don't want it to work down a ridiculous amount, but I do want it some now. You want it to a point where it's it's melted, but it's uh, not going to burn the crap out of you. And we don't want to put a ridiculous amount on, but we need to start putting it on like that, okay? And then, once it starts getting solid on the bow, go ahead and hold it back over your fire or your coals, and that's going to remelt that area and you can kind of wipe off the excess. We don't want it mounded up on here at all. A little goes a long way and we're going to do this all the way around front back the whole nine yards. So basically you're going to wipe it on and wipe it off. Wax on, wax off quite literally. And then once, don't be afraid to just go ahead and coat your hand in it too. And you're literally going to work it just like that and you're going to feel where it's at in the wood. It, see, it didn't take but a finger, and that's enough to do probably over half of a limb. So 
I've got probably two thirds of that limb that already are covered and it might be enough to do the whole limb. It does not take much. We do not want to cover this thing in wax and finish. And we can get the tip, we can get everything. But what you'll then do is once it's kind of on there, get a little bit more up in this area. I'll just do one limb at a time. A little bit there. Let me go ahead and work through this. First, get it all on. So yes, you can absolutely get too much. So I mean, when I'm dipping my finger and I'm, I'm getting a, a teeny bit on my finger like that and putting it on. And then I'm gonna reheat that to set it in. And don't be afraid, like as soon as it starts getting really glossy and runny, that's, that's kind of what you want. And you don't have to have a finish on the bow. Now that other bow that I showed you earlier, there was no finish on that. But this one we kind of want to do a really nice job, keep the grain from raising. And, okay, that's good. And so this finish is gonna help with that a little bit. Now you don't really want to get it on your leather, but if it's, you get a little bit on the edges, that's not gonna hurt a single thing. But the idea is, is this is gonna kind of slow down some of the absorption of moisture if it's super humid out. Um, and then as we store this in a dry place, it'll lose any moisture it has anyway. But you're going to work every little bit of this bow on this limb. And I'll do the other limb later, but I'll work this one so you can see. You're going to massage this in everywhere. And if it gets too hard to work, heat it right back up. So, and then you can rub it pretty hard. So like I have a, a kind of a thick, yucky spot here, you can see. Rub that hard till it softens up, and then you can wring that right off your finger, and then flick it right back in your pot, and go back into the stuff for next time. And this stuff will, when it's finally really cooled down, it should have a slight, a slight waxy feel. If it feels super waxy, then it's on there, or you can really see it, and it's hazed up, it's on there pretty thick. You don't need all that. You can really squeegee it right off. And that's another thing about the pine pitch because it dries harder than wax by itself is it should not be sticky when it's dry. Like right now it's still, it's still slippery and sticky and it's uncomfortable and you don't want your bow to be like that because then everything's going to stick to it. Hair's going to stick to it. Um, dirt and dust and everything. Is going to stick to it so if you have a sticky bow finish you're going to find it really annoying until it collects enough junk that it stops being sticky but when you activate it like this so you're using friction that will get it right down in all that wood fiber it'll fill all those gaps it'll melt itself down in and you can probably spend, like this, this limb's already coated. And then what you can do is once it's dry, I try not to hold the grip while my hands are like this. Once it's dry and cool and it's no longer sticky, come back. Now if you do did do it and it is still very sticky, then what you're going to want to do is you come back, you know, 20, 30 minutes later and it's still tacky and sticky, then that means your mixture was pretty off and I would... I'd be adding uh, something else in there to stiffen it, more beeswax, potentially pine pitch, whatever you think you need more of to take some of the grease and the sticky out of it. But once it stops being cool, if it feels like it's got too much on it, you can take a, fl a flint flake and you can basically scratch the surface. You will never take all that wax and stuff out of this wood at this point. It's on there. So if you ever had ideas that you wanted to put snakeskins on the back, you better do it before you ever do this. Because paint or snakeskins, you will never get anything to stick to this, even if you scrape it with a flint flake, because it gets down in that wood. So, like I said, if it does go on a little bit thick, and it's a little too filmy for you, go ahead and take a flake and when you do it, you'll see it peel right up and there's nothing wrong with that. You almost kind of want to do that to thin it out and then go ahead and use the friction again to set it back in. So it doesn't really change the look of the bow. It looks great and as soon as it's uh, 
as soon as this side is, is done, our bow is completely finished. We'll head on over, we'll do some video of shooting it, and I'll give you some performance specs on it. Don't expect this thing to be a speed demon, I'll tell you that. It is a very bare bones, primitive bow. But I tell you what, it's a good looking bow, especially building with all Stone Age technology. So, alright, I'll go ahead and finish the other side, and then we'll just go shoot this thing. Well, our bow's all finished up. Really happy with the tiller. Love the way it shoots. Everything about it's very, very nice. And we're gonna shoot through the chronograph, which obviously isn't terribly primitive, but it's really important for collecting data. So we're running sinew bowstring on it. Everything is completely primitive. The only thing that's not primitive, obviously, is the chronograph. So let's shoot this through the chronograph, and we can see at least the kind of the numbers that we're putting up. Now keep in mind, that I'm only drawing this bow about 22 inches. If we're if we're talking about making a bow that draws much further, 26, 28, 30 inches even in some cases, we're gonna have a much longer power stroke. And per pound on the bow and per power stroke, we're gonna be putting up higher numbers. So I'm kind of that anomaly in a way that we're on the lower end of scale for feet per second compared to what you could potentially be shooting. But uh, I already kind of know what the bow shoots because I've already shot it quite a bit. When we really want to talk about the primitive context or the, the real context of primitive people hunting with these bows, it is that there's no set draw length standard. Some people shot with a longer draw. Some people shot with a short draw very much like I do. Just like today, we have a lot of people. I have a lot of friends that shoot anywhere from an 18 to a 24 inch draw, which most traditional archers think is extremely, extremely short. And it's actually a lot more common than you think it is. In fact, a lot of people that shoot, say, a 28, or they think they shoot a 28-inch draw, when they measure their draw length in the way that I actually instruct them to, they're really surprised that a lot of them shoot only 23, 24 inches. So it's kind of neat to think about that. But we will do a test in the future on shooting a longer draw and how that affects the feet per second. But the speeds that we're shooting with this with this arrow, which is about 460 grains, I think. It was right around there, 460-ish, maybe 470. That's the numbers we're gonna be putting up, and this bow is, I think, right at, uh, I think, almost 55, 22 inches where I'm shooting it. So anyway, let's put it through the chronograph, and you can at least see the numbers that we're shooting. All right, so when you're talking about shooting those kind of feet per second with 55 pound bow, 460 grain arrow, and you're talking a hickory bow that was made with Stone Age tools and dried out over a fire, and it went from green live tree to finished bow in about two and a half weeks with a sinew bowstring and you're shooting in the 150s with it, that is enough to realistically kill anything in North America, especially, it might be a little on the light side for maybe moose or bison, teeter and maybe on elk, but stuff like deer and black bear, you have no problem at all killing with a bow just like this. We're, we're shooting uh, through pigs and deer, no problem with bows just like this that actually shoot even a little bit slower than this one. So Stone Age bow belt, sinew string, which typically does perform at a, at a slower feet per second than your more modern strings, and it's hickory. This, but this stave, at least even at this point in time, where it's been a while, um, but the whole bow is tillered in under two and a half weeks. Right now, this piece of wood from live tree to finished bow, it's been probably, probably more like three and a half weeks from complete start to finish, and a lot of that was just sitting around because I was busy doing other kind of work. So we've got some pretty good performance and I'm only drawing a dang thing about 22 inches so we got ourselves a real winner here. <laughs> 